Hello, everyone, and welcome to NSTA Web Seminars, where you can find live interactive learning at your desktop. Today's seminar is called Teaching NGSS in K-5, to Making Meeting Through Discourse. Our presenters today are Carla Zembel Soul, Mary Starr, and Kathy Redfrew. My name is Christina Crawley, and I'm going to be moderating today's program. So let's go ahead and get started with our introduction. Just a brief mention about our main presenters today. We have Carla joining us from Penn State University, where she's a professor of science education. Mary Starr, who's joining us from Michigan, where she is the executive director of the Michigan Mathematics and Science Center Network. And Kathy Revenfrew, who is joining us from Vermont at the Vermont Agency of Education. She is a K-5 science coordinator. And with that, I'm going to pass the baton over to Ted Willard. He is the director of NGSS at NSTA, and he's going to get us started. Thanks, Christina, and, and thank you so much. As everyone should know, Christina filled in at the last minute as one of our scheduled uh, moderators was had jury duty that was going to run late today, and so got a call at some point and ran home and has, has filled in here at the, the, the last minute, and we really appreciate it. Um, I, before we get to the full, full program, I just want to take a second here and just give you all a brief review of some of the pieces of the standards. Those of you who were last week, um, indulge me for a second, we'll be through it in no time. Um, the standards were developed by four organizations, the National Academies of Sciences, ACHIEVE, the American Association for the Advanced Science, and NSTA, obviously my favorite of the four. I hope it's yours too. There was a two-step process, first to develop the framework for K-12 science education, and then the standards. And the standards then feed into and affect all aspects of the education system, curriculum, instruction, assessments, pre-service education, and professional learning. And so the whole idea of three-dimensional learning is really pouring in. So talking about the framework itself, there are, if you have not read it, you should. There's, you can get a free PDF from the National Academies of Press. If you like a hard, you know, actual paper copy of a book, you can get it from NSTA Press. And the basic thrust of the framework is this idea of three-dimensional learning, first with scientific and engineering practices, cross-cutting concepts, and disciplinary core ideas. Those are the three dimensions. The practices, one of the main stars here, are things like developing and using models, analyzing and interpreting data, constructing explanation, or engaging in argument. These are the things that scientists do in their work and that students do in their um, in learning, and we want that to happen. We then also have the cross-cutting concepts. These are ideas, concepts that aren't unique to physics or chemistry or biology, but really cut across all of those different pieces. There are ideas like patterns, scale, systems, structure, and function. And then we have the disciplinary core ideas ourselves, life science, physical science, earth and space science, and engineering and technology has been added and is also now thought about as part of the science curriculum. Each of those core ideas drills down to some finer grain ideas. So we get force and motion, types of interactions, and stability and instability in physical systems, for example. And there's the whole idea of motion and stability. All of those pieces, as I said, were just developed in the framework and described in the framework. And then the standards folks took that work and went and de developed it. The standards were developed by a group of 26 states. All the states in blue were known as NGSS lead states. They had committees that reviewed the standards and provided feedback. There were 41 writers spread around the country. That gives you a sense of where they all were from. And the standards came out a couple of years ago. And at present, there are 14 states, 13 states in the D and District of Columbia that have adopted the standards. But there are also a few states that have developed their own standards based on the framework. And and this idea, again, of disciplinary core ideas, cross-cutting concepts, and especially practices are being infused in curriculum everywhere. At this point, over 30% of students live in states that have adopted NGSS. So let's take a look at a piece of NGSS just to get a sense of what it's like. 
we have a performance expectation here. Construct an argument that plants and animals have internal and external structures that function to support survival, growth, and behavior of reproduction. This performance expectation isn't describing what students should do in the classroom. It's describing what students should be able to do at the end of instruction. Teachers have still full control of what activities, what experiences their students should have. But this performance expectation actually provides a way to really look at and think about and, under, and assess what students' abilities are with the practices. So it talks about constructing the argument, as pointed out here, construct an argument with evidence, data, and our model. There's this idea of plants and animals have internal and external structure, structures that function to support survival, growth, behavior, and reproduction. That comes from this disciplinary core idea. And then the idea of systems and system models, that a system can be described in terms of its components and interactions, plays into this idea of internal and internal structures that function to support survival, growth, behavior, and reproduction. So with that all in place here, you can see how the performance expectations in NGSS provide a way to assess all three dimensions. And so the stage is now set for learning that it has students engaging simultaneously in all three dimensions. But with that, I'll pass things off to um, our full presenters and let them introduce thanks, themselves. Hello, everyone. Off to you. Um, welcome, and thanks for joining us in the second webinar in the series on teaching NGSS in elementary school. My name is Carla Zemblefall, and I'm a former middle school science teacher turned science teacher educator. It's my 19th year as a professor at Penn State University, and my research and practice is focused on teacher learning and how they come to support students' scientific discourse and practices. And I'm here tonight with my colleagues, Mary Starr and Kathy Renfrew. Um, Mary, why don't you go ahead and, um, and introduce yourself. Thanks, Carla. Um, my name is Mary Starr, and I am in Michigan, where right now it's, there's rainbows. It stopped raining, and it's beautiful. Um, I am the executive director of the Math and Science Centers Network, and we are very lucky to be on the cusp, I hope, of um, adoption of the uh, Next Generation Science Standards, assumed to be known as the Michigan Science Standards, and um, we're busy working with teachers to really think about how do these new standards um, inform our instruction and help us in our planning. And we're hopeful that we'll be able to see um, some of those examples today and share those with you and um, help to uh, improve all of our practice. Uh, Kathy, on to you. Hi, my name is Kathy Renfrew, <coughs> and I am from Vermont. And in my current, I was an elementary teacher for many years. Um, in my current job, I am the K-5 science coordinator, and I do a lot of professional development. And I was lucky enough to connect with these wonderful ladies and colleagues. And we've been able to do some great work together, and we hope to keep working together. And we hope that we will have some awesome conversations here this evening around um, making meaning through discourse. So um, we told you a little bit about um, ourselves. Now could you maybe tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, and why don't you use that clip art there to um, do that? And, and, and just, just a reminder that the, the little clip art is the tools that are just to the right-hand side of the participants' window. So it's going to allow you to stamp directly on the whiteboard, which a lot of you are doing already. If you have any trouble and it's not working for you, sometimes it depends on the device, um, go ahead and type your answer in the chat box. And I would also ask that if you have been to another one, if you have attended one of our webinars, um, if you could put a little um, note or check um, in, the, uh, in the chat window just to tell us what other context that you know 
uh, the three of us from. Oh, great. At the webinar last week, we did a series also um, during the school year, kindergarten through fifth grade, one week at a time. Great. Last week, a whole lot. <laughs> Regional science coordinators, fantastic. Last week, was anybody at the, um, the, at the STEM Institute in Atlantic City uh, yesterday? Just looking last week. Ted was, yes, I saw Ted there. Wonderful. Well, it's great to have you all with us tonight. And let's go ahead and get started. Our goals um, for this webinar are very much focused on classroom discourse that supports sense making in science. And more specifically, we're going to be highlighting scientific practices that provide opportunities for discourse rich interactions. We're going to share teacher and student talk moves that can actually shift discourse away from teacher telling and more to student talk and student sense making. We'll demonstrate um, through a, a video and examples how science talks can provide opportunities to make students' thinking visible, and we'll share relevant resources as we always do. This opportunity to discuss elementary science teaching will include uh, a video recording um, that we uh, are leveraging from another webinar that we provided during the academic year to highlight some other aspects of talk and how important that is in elementary classrooms. As always, uh, we just want to remind you about the interactions we have in the web seminar. Please be an engaged participant. It's really, um, it's a little odd sitting in a room all by yourself staring at a screen and not having people uh, and their uh, facial expressions and body language um, and direct interactions to help, to help keep you going. So Mary is, I imagine, in some room in Michigan. Kathy's probably in Vermont this week. Um, and I am back in State College. And so it, it's very difficult um, without, some, uh, without engagement. And the chat window is a great way to do that. We also ask that um, you participate to the polls um, when, we, uh, when we ask for that, like you did just a moment ago. And please presume positive intentions. That's certainly how we uh, set this learning opportunity up. We know that there are constraints, and we are hoping that regardless of um, your background, um, that you have the uh, opportunity to find some nugget, some idea that you can take back to your classroom. So we'll be asking that um, at the end of the session. So the new vision um, that the framework puts forward for K-12 um, science learning requires important shifts in instruction. And um, these are just a few of them. So I'm not trying to scare anybody. There are a lot of shifts. We're going to try and talk about a few of these tonight. Um, in fact, um, Mary's going to follow up in just a moment with three-dimensional learning. And you heard Ted talking about that. Um, but the um, one that we're going to really focus on today is here, this notion of teacher telling. We want to shift that um, to making thinking visible and then leveraging students' ideas um, to move the lesson forward. We find in our work that scientific and engineering practices are really useful in making this shift. Are, and, and in fact, probably essential in making these kinds of shifts that we're talking about. And so we tend to focus on them. We really draw on the literature that suggests, the research that suggests that when you're learning science um, disciplinary core ideas and scientific and engineering practices simultaneously in a way that's intertwined you learn both of those things better. Students learn both of those things in an enhanced way. So they're working together. And in our work, we tend to focus on developing explanations um, from evidence and arguing from evidence. And we believe that this can be really productive in leveraging other practices as well as uh, creating discourse-rich opportunities in classrooms. But I realized that in past webinars, I've never really explained to you the thinking behind this. So I'm just going to take a moment 
um, and share this slide with you. This is um, this really shows that ultimately our goal in working with children is meaning making around scientific phenomena. Really, how do students make sense of that? And we, as I mentioned in the previous slide, focus on constructing explanations from evidence. We put that in the center. But it's because we can leverage, you have to put something on the front burner. And whenever you foreground one thing, it's possible to background others. Um, but what we're trying to highlight by highlighting explanations and evidence is that we can leverage 3D learning and these discourse-rich opportunities in the classroom. There are also powerful frameworks for both teachers and students, and in this case we'll be sharing the claims evidence reasoning framework um, that can help you construct explanations. And there are some very useful instructional and assessment strategies that go along with that. So all of those pieces are working together, but they're working together to focus on children's sense making or meaning making. So let's take a closer look at three-dimensional um, learning, and I'll hand it so over to Mary. So we started Mary. using this analogy last week, and um, we're going to try it again, and I, partly because I love it. And I'm borrowing it from Arthur Eisencraft, who's a colleague of mine and works uh, very closely with um, high school teachers in developing project-based uh, science at the high school level. And he thinks about the three dimensions, um, disciplinary core ideas, science and dream practices, and cross-cutting concepts as this sort of a quilt. And the cool part about the quilt is that you can almost imagine that unless these three pieces, the three dimensions, are sewn together and are benefiting each other, right? They work together the quilt doesn't become a quilt. It's just strips of fabric. And the layers of the quilt are what really give it that, um, that the ability to keep you warm and, and, be, and have beauty. So we're t I'm trying to think about those three dimensions in, with this quilt analogy because it has those facets um, and because that, that's the, the sort of thinking that was represented in the um, framework for K-12 science education. So if you think about the quilt as the core ideas are these stars, and the cross-cutting concepts are the red um, sashing, and then the science engineering practices maybe are these the blue squares and then the binding areas, then you can see that when they come together, that provides that powerful experience for students. The next generation science standards performance expectations in, include those three dimensions, but they're included as assessment outcomes. So we know the, that the idea of the MGSS performance expectations is that at the end of instruction, students should be able to do these things, right? So for our example today, um, we're going to really focus on sound, um, in particular, um, uh, physical science, um, waves and their applications in technology. So it's, it's about waves and the properties of waves. And in um, the first grade in particular, because we have this wonderful video of um, teachers uh, using these ideas with particular phenomenon in first grade, and we thought we would share that uh, with regard, to, especially with regard to the discourse. So these are two of the performance expectations um, for first grade and, and waves. And I've color coded them so that you can see the science and engineering practices, the disciplinary core ideas, and the cross-cutting concepts within each of those performance expectations. But this is like the goal line. So I think about this as at the end of instruction, these are the things that kids, that the students ought to be able to do. So first graders, will need will want will be able to plan and conduct investigations to provide evidence that the vibrating materials can make sound and that sound can make materials vibrate. So that's the focus of today and that's the performance expectations at the end of the instruction. So these are the three parts. Um, the disciplinary core idea is about sound and vibration and vibrating matter and sound. The cross cutting concept is cause and effect. Um, specifically around simple tests and gathering evidence. And that really makes sense when you think about 
the science and engineering practice, which is plan and conduct investigations. So these three dimensions um, allow and support students in exploring and explaining the phenomenon around um, sound. Right? It's important even if you're not um, even if you're not um, a uh, first grade teacher, um, that you that you remember that there's this is a progression. So the planning of the next generation science standards and the framework for K-12 science education was around progressions, and this um, provides you an overview just of the wave properties um, topic for um, the progression from first grade through fourth grade, and then middle school and high school. And you can see in this progression that the sophistication of the ideas in increases, as well as the, the sim both similarities and changes in the, um, in the uh, cross-cutting concept. So if you look at back at the first uh, grade performance expectation, the cross-cutting concept was about cause and effect. That's also true in um, fourth grade, in eighth, in uh, the middle school, the cross-cutting concept is patterns. And then again, it's cause and effect in the, um, at the high school level for this particular performance expectation. All right, so when you put those three parts of the quilt back together, um, and you and they layer up again. We're back to that idea about three-dimensional learning and the shifts. So the the learning shifts now from um, separate pieces where we teach uh, skills or process skills or inquiry skills and disciplinary core ideas in a different piece, and then maybe the science themes to um, really focusing on how to use those three dimensions to explore, examine, and explain um, phenomena. So today's phenomenon we're going to focus particularly on is, um, is vibrating objects and objects vibrating. So in particular, it's around the um, variety of different kinds of vibrating objects and how those objects make sound. The topic isn't what we're going to um, teach the students. The students are going to explore, examine, and explain. Um, these ideas around um, vibrating sounds. So it's it's also become a, uh, a sort of a focus of mine to um, think about um, what happens in instruction around three dimensions uh, of science learning. So the performance expectations in the next generation science standards help us to understand the um, outcome measures. But what are we really going to do on a day-to-day -day basis, and how does the, this idea of three dimensions of science learning help us to craft um, it, learning experiences for students? So these are the um, core ideas for, for today's uh, webinar, and the cross-cutting concepts, and the science and engineering practices. So then the question is, how do we put these three dimensions together in instruction as we're planning. So you remember that the cross-cutting concept, for example, um, was uh, for, for this performance expectation is um, uh, cause and effect. But that might not be the focus of the instructional activities that you have students do. Perhaps your cross-cutting concept um, is around patterns and your science engineering practice is around developing and using a model. Um, it's perfectly appropriate in instruction to think about different cross-cutting concepts, science and engineering practices um, from the ones that are specifically highlighted in the performance expectations because this is instruction. So the idea is that at the end of instruction, students should be able to, to complete the, a, an assessment task that, that measures the performance expectation. But within instruction, you want to engage students in many different cross-cutting concepts, many different science and engineering practices in order to um, explore phenomenon that are related with the disciplinary core ideas. All right. So then the question is, um, 
if, if we need to focus on these disciplinary core ideas, how do we get that uh, background information that we might need? So we're going to shift a little bit, and Kathy has created some resources and wants to, and we will um, share with you some resources for that content knowledge. Sorry, Kathy. Ooh, sorry, that's okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so as Mary said, that we are focusing on that disciplinary core idea. Um, and there are different um, resources that we should really begin to think about and go to. Um, lots of time in the work that we've done together with elementary teachers, and even in my own experience many times, I found that I have to dig deeper, especially with NGSS, to really understand the content that I want the students to understand. So one of the things that NSTA has is they have these ebooks that they've created. Um, I ended up, I, I put energy here, um, and it's just here as an example um, for you to think about it um, in terms of using some of these resources. Another resource that I don't want anybody to forget that's here all the time are the web seminar archives. Um, one of the things we do for each of these web seminars is to record them. And that recording e includes the chat. And we know that there is very valuable material, lots of valuable material in the chat. And I couldn't um, mention resources without mentioning my Bible. Um, and that's the framework for the K-12 science education. It's available from National Academies Press as a hard copy or free. Uh, but all of these resources are here to help us really get a handle on those disciplinary core ideas. And there are many other resources, but these are just a few. And some of the other ones I'll talk about later on in um, the resource section. I'm going to change gears a little bit again. And in this, we're really going to start in this next section of the webinar to really begin to focus on instruction. Um, and the pieces that we plan on talking about and spending our time and hoping we have great dialogue about is looking at prior knowledge um, and also really beginning to un help us talk about students, how students make meaning using discourse. And We'll do that in a, in a few different ways. We'll talk about talk moves. We'll talk about phenomena. We'll talk about formative assessment. And last but not least, we'll, we'll be really talking about making students' ideas visible. How can we share that, those ideas? Um, and again, as Carla mentioned in the very beginning, one of those big shifts, it's from teacher telling the students to rich classroom d discourse. So, with that said, I want to quest I have a question for you. Why do you think it's important, it's critical, that we elicit students' ideas before we embark on our fully fleshed out lesson or unit plan? Please write your responses in the chat. Oh, boost engagement. See what they already know. You need to get those ideas out meaningful. Um, oh, you guys write so fast, it's hard to read. Um, Allow children have their own perspectives, uh, prior knowledge, to see where students are at, tap into their knowledge, yes, and really think about what they're bringing to the table. Um, and that's really important, too. Um, build metacognition uh, to spark their involvement. I've seen lots and lots of things. I'm going to let people type for just a couple more minutes. And then I'm going to go back and read these, because I think that's pretty exciting. So I'm going to move on. But I've seen some great ideas here as we begin to talk. So just a little bit more about eliciting um, children's ideas. And I think the first really important thing that we need to remember is that children aren't are not blank slates. They come to school with ideas. Some of those ideas are really sophisticated, but some are really still in development. 
some of students' ideas might have some inconsistencies, or they might be ideas that are partially consistent with the science ideas around the phenomena that we're going to be working with in, in school. Um, but by eliciting those student ideas, it can give us as teachers a way to begin thinking about our instruction. And maybe, depending on what happens, we might have to go back and think about changing some of those original plans that we made. And the one thing I think I really want to think about here is that we often used to say um, and really focus on misconceptions, but I really liked the way that Paige Keeley described it. Um, and when she talked about the inconsistencies or ideas in development. Um, so I just wanted to, to something to think about because, again, students come to us with a fund of knowledge. And I hope that we really begin to think about that fund of knowledge. OK. So now we have a poll. And I'm going to let Christina help us do this, but what I would like want you to do is to use your clip art to ID all the different ways that you currently assess students' prior knowledge. Okay, so I've given you access to the clip art tool. So just same thing again. Mark it directly on the whiteboard after you've clicked it on the toolbar. And if you have any trouble at all, go ahead and type in the chat box. Oh, my goodness. I bet there's others. Oh, yes, drawings and demonstrations. Use all. Writing poetry. Seeing lots of different things. And this chart, this poll, is quickly filling up. Label diagrams. A oh, whiteboard works. I used to use lots of whiteboards. I think we're pretty ready to move on. Oh, sharing on Google Docs, getting in the technology piece. Very cool. OK, I'm going to move on. But this is pretty exciting to see all the different ways that people are using right now um, and, and thinking about when they're trying to elicit student ideas. So I'm going to share a couple of different ways and some of the ones that we really do use a lot. Um, and some of the ones that I really use a lot is the probes from Paige Kelly. Uh, I remember how excited I was the first time I ever saw one of Paige's books. Um, and I've, because of all the information that I could get from these books, um, because not only does Paige have a probe, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, but she has a whole chapter about about these um, about these these probes, and it talks about what students are thinking, what could be expected in elementary grades, what are some of the inconsistencies that we might find with students, some suggestions for helping our students move forward in their understanding of ideas, and the other thing about Paige's probes is that each of the probes were written with distractors that were chosen for a particular reason. And usually the reason or the choices for the wording and the way those distractors are written is Paige was very specific in, in trying to get at um, or point out maybe an, an inconsistency in a child's idea or really trying to dig deeper into a child's thinking. Now, this particular probe, Rubber Band Box, is from the K2 um, volume uh, that Paige has written. And this is um, very, um, oh, I've lost the word. But this is the type of pr uh, probe you'll find because one of the things in this paper in this K2 book is Paige really focused on, with younger children, the idea of having them talk about it, have them talk about their ideas, um, and then making that thinking visible 
in through discourse. The next slide is is was written about sound, um, and you can see here there are lots of choices on this. Um, so students would choose all the different ways that they think that sound was made, and then at the bottom they would explain their thinking. So that's just a little brief insight into the, the, some of the thinking about and the importance of eliciting students' ideas. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Carla to move us forward in making meaning for children. Thanks, Kathy. I, I was just reading the uh, chat window as you were talking, and there's some really great conversation going on there. I really appreciate the uh, idea sharing and resource sharing that's going on tonight. Um, before we head into the next section in which we'll actually share the video that um, Mary made reference to earlier in the session, is to bring it back to the diagram that the ultimate goal is meaning making around scientific phenomena. And we already, did, what Mary did was to demonstrate quite nicely for us with the quilt representation about three-dimensional learning. Um, she let you know that we're going to be thinking a little bit about sound tonight um, and sound content. And um, then Kathy came in and shared, well, if you don't know, if you don't understand the disciplinary core idea yourself, or as well as you would like to, there are lots of resources available to you. But in order to ultimately create these discourse-rich opportunities for learning, we need to start by knowing where our students are, what they come to us with, and how not just to get access to it or make it visible, but to leverage it to, in our case, construct explanations from evidence. And so we're going to start this next section by talking about one framework. There are others. I, I saw that someone uses the five E's. Other people use um, modeling and model-based reasoning and science. But um, the framework we're going to focus on tonight is the claims evidence reasoning framework. And um, this was initially developed by Kate McNeil and Joe Krejcik. Um, and it came from the research and practice, sort of this back and forth. But it turned out that it was a very powerful way um, to guide teachers' thinking when they were planning, but also when they were teaching. And then also turned out to be a really nice scaffold for kids' talk and kids' writing. So in a claim evidence reasoning um, framework, what we're talking about is all of these components together are what constitutes a piece of an explanation. So you might have multiple claim evidence reasoning sequences that you develop over time that allow you to get to explanation. But ultimately, we're really trying to leverage evidence, get kids thinking and talking about evidence so that they can make sense of phenomena. I actually really like this representation of the work because it reminds us that we need to begin with phenomena, that kids need to be really excited and engaged in that phenomena and want to understand what it is and why it's happening, that their investigations that they do through um, activity or um, experimental design and tests that you're doing or just um, other kinds of systematic observations provide evidence from which claims can be uh, generated. So this is a really useful um, framework. And that you might have to go through this whole process multiple times to get to a scientific causal explanation for phenomena. But we're going to start with, uh, with again, what do kids know about the phenomenon? And Mary was talking about vibrating objects so, uh, and, and sound. So if what you can do is kind of take a look at these images um, from Judy's class. You'll see Judy is in the black and white striped shirt. Um, she's been, uh, she just retired actually. She's been a first grade uh, teacher for quite a while in the local school district. Um, and she has gone into this classroom uh, to help out with the lesson. These aren't even actually her kids. So in the chat window, would you please um, just jot down a couple of your ideas um, about wh what kids are doing in these images and why they're doing it based on the kinds of things that we've been talking about so far. So tuning forks to investigate vibration, making observation, discussing. Someone notice that they're writing. 
love to know how you know they're doing CER yet. I, I hope you see that they're using CER a little bit later. Explaining, listening, writing, recording. Really nice. Um, and a few of you are starting to make the connection with their, their doing all these things, making observations, um, talking, listening, sharing ideas around the phenomena, so the tuning fork, the vibrations. And Mary had alluded to us um, in, in the prior part that that really is the phenomena that we're looking at, are these vibrating objects. Um, and I'm, I'm going to borrow a quote from a new friend of mine, a new, a new friend and colleague, Emily Miller, who is one of the writers for NGSS, that phenomena, you have to have it. <laughs> um, kids have to be investigating something that's really interesting and engaging, but it doesn't always need to be phenomenal. Something for us as an adult um, might not be that interesting, but kids, when they um, when they make sound, in this case with tuning forks, they get a tuning fork to vibrate, and you stick it in a bowl of water, but you can go for days on that one. Kids really get excited and interested and want to understand what's going on. But remember, ultimately, we want them to think about what causes sound, but also how do we test to figure out whether you always need vibrations to make sounds. So Kathy put this nicely earlier. There are no blank slates. So learners have prior knowledge. They come to us with that, and that shapes their future learning. And that prior knowledge is essential, and, and not just the prior knowledge, the ongoing attention to students' ideas and instruction are absolutely essential to crafting consequential learning opportunities. You really have to pay attention to students' ideas about the phenomena, how they initially explain it, and how those explanations change over time in light of instruction. So but before the lesson, it's always hard, I, I think, when we distill extensive, well thought out instruction down to five or six minutes that we're going to share with you on a webinar um, like this. So it, I think it's really important that you know that be, what happened before what you're about to see. And what happened before is that um, G came into the class, they, they are studying um, sound. The idea was that different kids went to different stations, and those different stations had objects like tuning forks, guitars, drums, different kinds of musical instruments, computer speakers, and they didn't rotate among stations. Each group got to work at a station, and figure out first how to make sound, what did you have to do to make sound with the objects that you have, and then they recorded their observation. And an adult at each table, and I know what you're thinking, we don't have an adult that can sit at every table in my school, but just listen to the idea. The adult, adult then asks the kids to share what their drawings were about. And then we, they came to a science conference together and shared those ideas using their drawings and the scaffold. These are six-year-old kids, so keep that in mind. Um, but the kids were completely excited at the different stations and very ready to share. And when they were sharing out, they got the other kids interested in what had happened at their station. So that's going to be important background as we move forward. I want to let you take a closer look at what um, kids actually drew um, and talked about. So um, can you tell what station that they're at um, from their drawings only? If you, um, let's look at drawings first, because that's where students started, just with the drawings. Anybody want to type in the chat window? Which The tuning fork. Interesting, yes. That would, you can kind of tell, like, um, not from any single drawing, but as you kind of go around, you can tell that this was the tuning fork. Um, and their task was make sound, use the tuning fork to make sound. Um, and so they tried lots of different things, tapping lots of different places, um, and um, then the teacher asked them to talk about their drawings. And these, the, the text that you see, sound waves, and then they came back, it was invisible sound waves come out of things. Um, they, they, you make sound by banging something. There's some talk about shivering, and some kids use the language of vibrations, but they haven't agreed on that yet, so the teacher put those in parentheses, make sound. And so then the tuning board group brought this to the science conference. 
The second thing we have here is that um, what station do you think this one was? Yeah, it is impressive. I'm, I'm looking at the chat window. Guitar. The guitar is the clearest one. Rubber band guitar, musical instrument. So, yeah, so there's a guitar, and you can start to tell once you see the guitar that maybe those other things are drums, and maybe there's something else in there. This one, to me, is a little bit harder when you just look at drawings to figure out what kids are thinking. But if you he hear what happened from the text that the teacher wrote about what kids talked about when she said, well, tell me about your drawings, when strings are moving, that makes sound. Sound is shorter on the thumb piece. Rubber band doesn't move as much. The harder you pull, I really like this, or push, the louder or softer it is. And touching the strings makes sound stop. Now, the amazing thing about all of this stuff is that some point during instruction, um, and some of it you won't see in the six-minute clip, the teacher takes these initial ideas and continues to build on them. But this is what they came in knowing, all right? And it was really important, the draw and the write. And we, we, we call that a quick draw and write. And with older kids, they might do their own writing, or you might have a recorder that interviews people about their drawings if you were working with older kids. But this is pretty amazing for initial incoming um, student ideas. So let's um, shift to watching the video. You know what the, the kids knew beforehand. Um, if you've seen our webinars before, you know that I am in central rural Pennsylvania. Um, this particular video, well, I should back up. What that means is um, it's dairy farm and um, state park. Country. So we're essentially isolated in that it's a couple hours. It's only a couple hours to get to Philly and to um, to Washington D.C. and to New York um, or Pittsburgh, but it's still a couple of hours. So the, we're working in the school district around us, and there are some constraints to doing that. Um, and and you'll see some of that in the classroom. It's highly resourced, um, and there's not a ton of um, cultural and linguistic diversity. And I know many of you are struggling that in your, within your classrooms, and, and we have some ideas about how to help. But this is the second month of the school year. We were doing these webinars um, last year, and we started, when did we start, Ted? We started in September, and um, we did one every single month. So that, that means that this really is the end of September in a first grade classroom. So what you will see um, is the teacher working in this classroom is Judy Kerr, but it's not her classroom. This is actually a teacher um, who was next door to her in her school who wants to do more science teaching in this way. And so Judy was a guest in her classroom working with these kids and also mentoring the teacher and the student teacher who were in that classroom. And something else to keep in mind, this video, the video resources we have from this sequence is really long. It wasn't 75 minutes at once. I see that, uh, that column is 75 minutes for science. Um, it was 75 minutes over multiple days, right? So they, they did the exploration of sound and the phenomena of sound first. They did their science conferences on another day where they were sharing what they observed in uh, with the phenomena and the elicitation of their prior knowledge, their ideas and their thinking. And then there's the lesson that you're about to see, which is where they're taking those ideas to design a test. Um, as we do this, I, I, I always give this um, caution that um, we are really trying to learn from practice here as a community. And it takes incredible courage, bravery, um, however you want to think about that in order, we're, make, we're talking about kids being in a climate where they can contribute their ideas and feel like they're valued. Now we're talking about being in a community of teachers and a community of practice in which we are making our teaching public. We're asking questions about it. It's the focus of inquiry. It's not intended to be a perfect example of teaching. I don't believe in, in my opinion that there is such things. And we won't have the, Judy here tonight to be able to ask. But this is a vision of what's possible. She's opened up her class, or her teaching at least, to us so that we can learn from her. So in your comments about Judy and Judy's teaching and the kids and their learning, please 
Um, keep in mind that um, it's very generous, and if people, um, if teachers in the profession don't allow us in um, to have insight into their classrooms and their teaching, it's hard to move the whole community forward. So we really, really, really need um, people who are willing to let us think hard together by making their teaching public. So with that, I'm going to ask for a little bit of help in pushing out the video. Um, the two things I would really like for you to be thinking about um, is how the teacher elicits students' ideas um, and how the teacher uses those ideas to move the lesson forward toward the goal of designing and conducting their own experiment. Okay, about great. So I'm going to sound. push the video. You don't have to do anything. It's just going to take you from this screen where you are now into your browser, if it's um, Firefox or Chrome or whatever preferred browser you have. When you get the, the video screen, you do need to press play, so don't forget to do that. You may have to adjust the audio. It was really loud for me, um, so you might need to turn it down. But go ahead and watch the video, and when you're done, if you could, um, I changed the multiple choice button. It used to say A, B, C, D, E to yes or no. So when you are back in Blackboard and you finished reading or finished uh, watching the movie, um, do give me a green check and then you know when to start up again. So I'll go ahead and start the movie and I'll also put it in the chat afterwards. So it looks like we have about 60 people back um, so far. As you come back, think about that question and type in the chat window about how the teacher elicited students' ideas and how she used those ideas, or whether, you might not think she did, I guess, um, used those ideas to move the lesson forward. And by moving the lesson forward, it's towards the goal of having kids design their own investigation. And we'll give a couple minutes for others to finish up.
So there are a lot of really great observations of the teacher and the hard work that she was doing um, throughout this process in terms of how she asked questions, how she cued in on um, students' ideas, um, and use those in terms of um, what the kids were planning and how they were planning to do a scientific investigation, so testing things more than once. Um, she started with the whole idea of vibrating, right? Um, she knew from the drawings that kids were talking about shivering and, and in their presentations during the scientist conference, so she came back to that and really started this with like this notion of vibrating and what that is so that everybody had a sense of it. And then she came back around to um, the fact that uh, there was a way to annotate their drawings, you know, as they made sure they would all have to be drawing the same. So I love the child who goes, you have to do the ch 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 to do the, the sort of the, the wave uh, to, to somehow vocalize what those little vibrations might look like. There's so many things in here, so one of the things that she really was doing is trying to take um, what she knew. She, they didn't go to all the stations the first time because she wanted them to start by testing things that were in those different stations. So the kids, when they heard about the tuning forks, they really, uh, the other kids really wanted to test the tuning forks, and they had something to start with. So she starts with things that they have. But then she also later on, um, and you don't see it in this video, but she takes other things like the voice. So kids, uh, kids are starting to disagree. She points that out. What do scientists do when they disagree? Well, they go test it. And so the voice is a really interesting one, and they, the kids have a couple of other ideas that they start with the things that they decide they want to test, and then she adds in, in the next lesson, some of the things that she heard that um, kids could discover, again, ideas that they had on the table that they weren't really sure about, like voice and vibrations. So it gives them something. They have ownership. They're really excited. They're really invested. They design the investigation, and they really, really want to figure it out. So thanks for all your great ideas with that. The patience um, with the inattentive students. Um, I don't know if you've ever been with first graders, six-year-olds at the beginning of the year. I thought they were amazingly well behaved. Um, but when I take colleagues who teach secondary into those uh, early grade classrooms and they see kids and the kids are wiggling around and um, tapping and jumping and doing all kinds of really interesting things, <laughs> um, they get distracted by it. I've even had them describe it like it looks like an amoeba on the carpet. It's just moving as all one organism just around and around. But those kids were really, I think, really um, engaged in the process of, of constructing and it was pretty, um, constructing the investigation. And it was pretty amazing to see six-year-olds do this at the beginning of the year. But what I want to point out through this video is the teacher was working really hard and really intentionally to make that happen. So back here, I just want to remind us the goal is children's meeting making. We're using CER as a way to help us do that, and you were able to observe some really discourse-rich opportunities. Again, when we talk about CER, it's all of this together constituting um, an explanation, a causal explanation for the phenomena that's under investigation. And so what you'll notice when the teacher is, is doing this is that the, she starts with they present their observations as data. And sometimes in the classroom we don't think of observations as data. Um, and they are. So she starts by having students share their data. And while they're sharing their data or evidence, so I'm going to go back to the slide just to say that CER doesn't mean you go from C to E to R, <laughs> claims to evidence to reasoning. Um, we're actually starting with the phenomena and what kids understand about it. So here the kids are, they're sharing their initial data, their initial observations about this phenomena together as a jumping off place. And the teacher is, and you don't see this in this particular video, but she's using an instructional strategy that goes along with the claims evidence reasoning framework to begin to record students' observation because, as you know, you might only teach science in elementary school once a week or a couple times a week but for only 20 minutes. And so she wants the class to have a record of her time of what's going on. 
And then the students kind of come up with this, and she, she leads a little bit. This is the beginning of the year. Later in the year, these kids will be able to do some of this on their own. But from their evidence, they come up with an initial claim that vibrations make sound, and they don't agree about it. Some kids feel really strongly about it. Others are sort of maybe, and others say, no way. Your voice doesn't, your voice, no, no vibrations when, when, um, when you're talking. So that is a really nice um, leverage point um, for meaning making. So what she presses on next is what do we need to do to figure that out? And in doing that entire sequence and moving through that, she's ultimately getting at the performance expectation that Mary talked about. And the performance expectation by nature integrates the disciplinary core ideas and the practices and the cross-cutting concepts. So we see here the practice of planning and conducting investigations um, and the DCI about vibrating materials and how you can make and change sounds. So all integrated, that's a really nice base. You can't end here. There's more work to be done. But the work, that work has to be done around children's ideas and sense making. So if you don't know about this document, I, I highly recommend it. I found out about it through um, a couple different ways, but most recently through Kathy. And this is the Turk Talk Primer. If you Google it, you will find it. It's a free download. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful resource for supporting the kind of talk that has to happen in the classroom on the part of the teacher and the students um, to lead to consequential learning. And so this notion of talk is providing a window to student thinking, supporting um, consequential learning and meaningful associations for language development. So um, especially for your language learners, the opportunity um, to draw and then maybe talk about their drawing rather than write about their drawing or share their drawing um, includes them in the lesson and helps them connect um, between the phenomena and the drawings and um, the language. Encourages reasoning with evidence. Apprentices students into the social and intellectual practices of science. That's a direct quote, and I love that one. And then supports the social skills and encourages risk taking in the classroom. All of those things are really important. I mean, as a teacher, I have so much respect um, for, for elementary teachers who do this. You're simultaneously working on the social norms, the social, the academic, um, the emotional well-being of all the children in your classroom, um, and talk. Uh, conveys so many messages that we need to be thinking about, but it's also very important to highly productive academic work. So not only can it be exciting intellectually for students and teachers, but highly productive academically. So Sarah Michaels, I think, is with us tonight, or at least she was in the beginning. And um, I really love Ready, Set, Science. Um, this is something that uh, Mary Ann, Kathy, and I have been using for a long time. Um, initially, it was one of the one of the best. I think the the chapter five on making thinking visible in the Ready, Set, Science um, book is that is a brilliant chapter, um, and it really focuses on the kinds of teacher. It's referenced as talk moves, but what can teachers be doing? Um, and the, what kinds of questions can they be asking, again, to elicit students' ideas and then help move the lesson forward? So you see these, this adding on. I hope you started to hear, I think in the comments I saw it, the agree-disagree language start to come up, even with the kids. Keep in mind that this is their second day with Judy and their second day doing science at the beginning of the school year. And you could see some of the kids already they like this notion of a degree disagree. They're, they're starting to use it, and they'll use it with more sophistication as it is fostered over time in the classroom. We developed um, for the book, What's Your Evidence, a series of talk moves that can be used as well um, when you're working on explanation building in the classroom. And when you have kids in small groups, you know that some groups are way ahead and some groups will start to fall behind, and what ultimately um, you want to be able to do is instead of just stopping by groups and say, how are you doing? Can I help you with your setup? It's more like, wow, how does that, if they're getting off task, that's really interesting. Can you tell me how that, ha that helps us answer our guiding question? Or what does that tell us about 
sound and vibration. And that's a nice way, whether you're in a whole group or small group, to give, bring people back, um, bring your children back to the focus. Also starting to ask some groups about patterns or an initial claim they can make, things like that, um, or what do you think next kinds of questions will happen next are also very productive in the classroom. So those resources are all um, available to you, what your evidence is available through the NSTA store. The Ready, Set, Science that I just talked about is uh, available as a download from National Academies Press. The big point I'm going to leave you with tonight before turning it back over to my colleagues is that it's not enough to ask questions and elicit students' ideas. Students' ideas have to be leveraged to move thinking forward. And, and and in both ways, with the individual child and with the entire class. But asking questions is a good place to start. So I don't want you to be overwhelmed by the fact that now I have these ideas on the table and I don't know where to go with them. Getting them on the table is the first step. So starting to make those questions routine in your thinking and starting to provide time for you to really think about how you're going to, which ones and how you're going to leverage those and for what purposes um, is really important next step to make. So with that, um, I think Mary's going to walk us through a little bit of formative assessment. And we're really tight tonight, um, so we'll see where we end up. OK. We are, as Carla said, a little tight on time. Um, but So we're going to do a little bit um, around formative assessment, mostly because it builds right out of what um, Carla was just talking about, about that intentionality and planfulness. So. When I watched that video, I noticed that Judy must have sat down before the implementation of that lesson and planned out those questions. I don't know how you get a, a group of first graders to engage and explore that way um, without knowing exactly what you needed to ask them and in the direction that you wanted the discussion to go. So I really am um, working to think about what are the ways that we can support embedding more formative assessment into our teaching? And that assessment is much more than just um, what I used to do, which is, you know, oh, the kids are shaking their heads. They look like they're all with me, so we'll just keep moving on. Um, it's got to be much more intentional, much more planned, and then the information has to be used to um, change instruction as, as um, the lessons move forward. So there's a couple of, um, of uh, the, the resources or, or experiences that Carla talked about. Um, this idea of the um, students with the teacher having the whole class discussion, um, or students with other students, small group discussions. Sometimes, um, just as another idea around those large group discussions, having small group discussions before the whole class discussion really helps to um, increase student participation. And um, somebody in the chat window is mentioning um, a lot of off-task uh, uh, ideas, right? So off-topic ideas. And, so, and in many classrooms, those small group discussions help kids to actually stay on task and um, on topic better in the large group discussions. Um, and then, of course, formative assessment through the science notebooks. Um, and the you know very common is when we um, circulate around the room and listen as students investigate. Um, and even there, the idea for um, planful questions and more uh, deep and rich questions than you know uh, the one that's sort of the backup, which is um, how's it going or how's the, how's your activity going, um, and really pushing students and by being planful and prepared. Kathy? So we've been talking about formative assessment. And we, Carla um, mentioned a little bit about making thinking visible. She really mentioned it in terms of Ready, Set, Science, my favorite chapter, um, making thinking visible, chapter five. Um, here are a couple of ways that student ideas can be made visible. I'm not going to take a lot of time. But I would love to see your ideas in the chat as we move on in terms of what, um, what ideas or things you might do to make things visible. 
So please just take a couple of minutes and talk and type in as fast as you can. And I'm going to move quickly. So um, I just want to give us a couple of ideas um, about that. Exit cards, parking lot, exit slips. Um, Padlet, I love the idea. That's something that I'm trying to get in my repertoire. Whiteboards, I used to have a class set of small whiteboards and, and use those. Um, science journals. OK, because I'm short on time, we're not going to spend much time here. But by making things invisible, then everybody's thinking is visible. That exit ticket, when you do just the exit ticket, then only you and that student really knows what what everybody else, what that person is thinking. But when we try to make our thinking visible, then it becomes public record. And we can let all 31 of the children in the classroom know what each other is thinking. And this is so important because it helps our students build their own conceptual knowledge. So I'm uh, moving on again. Making thinking visible. Students need to be able to share their ideas in lots of different ways and to communicate through talking, presenting, emails, books, Padlets, um, Twitter, uh, collaborate, as Mary mentioned, in small groups, large groups, class discussions, science meetings. I love the verbiage, the language that Carly used to science conference. I hadn't thought about it like that. Um, the idea that students can disagree and argue um, about evidence that's so important. Scientists do the same things. They share their ideas. They communicate through talking and presenting, emails. They write books and articles. They collaborate in research groups. And they disagree and argue with evidence. By making thinking visible, we are being transparent, and we are really helping our students to be more like scientists. Um, we have seen in this webinar um, that classroom discourse and formative assessments can be vehicles for helping our students to make meaning. And these same vehicles are the vehicles that, that, that scientists use. So I just wanted to say that those are so Cool. And one more thing, as we now begin to wrap it up here, Carla started in the beginning with this idea of shifting to the new vision of science learning for, with NGSS. Three-dimensional learning is critical, you know, and how we're moving from, from little factoids to big core ideas, from skills to practices, and for very discrete to very connected items. Phenomena. I can't say that enough. But again, like Carla said, phenomena doesn't have to be phenomenal every time. Again, teacher telling to rich student discourse and multiple opportunities, as Mary discussed, and away, away, away from activity or mania to evidence-based scientific explanations and modeling. And that shift includes a coherent sequence of learning opportunities. And we will be talking about more about that next week. So I'm going to take a breath, but I'm also going to share a couple more um, a couple more resources with you. Um, I don't know if many everybody knows, but I've been an online um, advisor for the Learning Center, so it's a special place to me. And there is so much information and so many resources that you can find there. Um, it's, and creating your library and getting creating collections for yourselves so you know where you when you want work around sound, it's all in one place. And that's why I created the collection around sound and making meaning through discourse. Um, some of these other NGSS at NSTA. And I'm going to give a little shout out to Susan Locke right down here in the bottom right hand column, um, a Vermont teacher. And but this site is really developing and getting more rich with richer and better resources every day. Ted will talk to you more about that. Again, here on this one slide, I've crammed in as many things as I could. Um, but you can see there were some we didn't mention here tonight. We did talk about 
and taught science, um, STEM teaching tools, responsive teaching, tools for ambitious science teaching. All of these are excellent resources. Interested in continuing these conversations? So Mary can jump in too, but this is our new project and we hope to get started um, in a few weeks. And we're going to hold this chat just prior to the NGSS Twitter chat. So Mary, do you have anything else you want to add to this piece? Um, I'm hoping that we'll get a lot of people to join us. Um, all, uh, alternating Thursdays starting uh, August 20th and Kathy and I will be there and we've got some of our friends coming too and we're hopefully going to be filled out with all of uh, 140 something others. So thanks Kathy. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I hope people join us. Um, I can speak for myself that Twitter is, is an amazing way um, to enrich your professional learning. Speaking of professional learning, can you type in the chat one thing that you will take away from today's webinar that will help you when you go back to the instructional setting um, you're in? Um, and love to see them. Questioning techniques, making thinking visible, great resources, assessing prior knowledge, talk, clues, inquiry techniques, oh, so many things. I am so excited. Um, I want to tell you that the three of us love these webinars. We love having the dialogues. We love the conversations. Um, and everything you share with us in the chat gives us more material and ideas and thoughts about what we might do next. And with that, I'm going to move on. And I couldn't get off without promoting our final in this particular series um, for next week, which is planning a coherent storyline. And we certainly hope that you'll be there um, again. We love doing this, and we love working with you and talking with you. And now I think I'm turning this over to Ted. And yes, Kathy, you are. I want to thank you so much. Uh, thanks to to all of our presenters. We've had we'll give them a big applauding in a, in a few minutes here. But before we do that, I want to just take a moment and let you know about some of the NGSS and NSTA resources. Obviously, we should start off and point out that you can find the standards at nextgenscience.org. You can also find a lot of resources, including the standards themselves, at nsta.org/ngss. Um, it's the, I like to say it's a digital destination for all things NGSS. We've got discussion forums. We've had a great chat tonight. If you want to continue, we can, you can go to the Learning Center and see those. If you are an NSTA member, we also have a listserv devoted specifically to NGSS, and I strongly encourage you to sign up for that. We've now had two of our web seminars on teaching NGSS and K5 this summer. We've got next next week, same bat time, same bat station, um, August 5th, um, planning a coherent storyline. Hope to see you there for that. And then we've got some additional web seminars coming in August on putting evidence statements to work in your classroom and how to use NGSS sample classroom assessment tasks. And we'll have uh, some of the staff of the chief, I think, involved with those web seminars. Um, we have a tremendous number of archived web seminars, over 40, pushing towards 50 at this point. One for each of the practices, for each of the cross-cutting concepts, each of the disciplinary core ideas. We've done the series that these um, amazing presenters tonight have done this past year on uh, the elementary grades. I'll also point out we've got a tremendous number of articles in all of our different journals, and we'll be doing a special series this summer, I mean, sorry, this coming school year again, well, with the series of articles that will be each appear in each of the journals on NGSS. Books galore. Um, I'm partial to the things on the right side for some reasons. Um, but we have a lot of different books on NGSS and more on the way. Keep your eye out for those. Discover the NGSS. This is an e-book. Um, something that if you haven't tried, I think you'll really enjoy. It's a 
interactive, self-paced um, learning experience. You can, you can spend for up to 40 hours going through it. It comes with a unit planner that can help you design your units around in GSS. Um, there are some embedded assessment tasks to help you sort of see if your understanding is developing. Um, you can work it on a Mac or a PC, or you can work it on any tablet device by using the NSTA Reader app. So take a look at that. Hope we'll see some of you at our conferences this fall in Reno, Philadelphia, and Kansas City. I know I'll be at all of those. I bet you that some of our that our presenters will probably be at some of them as well. And with that in mind, I will pass things to Christina, who can um, give another little shout out to our wonderful presenters and tell you how to fill out your evaluation. Okay, great. So, um, huge thanks to our presenters today. If you guys want to jump on your emoticons, and go crazy with applauses and approvals and smiling faces whatever you like or comments in the chat box, that'd be great. We had a lot of information to get through tonight um, and we got through it all and I think it was very clear and engaging and I think everyone's going to enjoy uh, getting a chance to go through the archive recording as well. So huge thanks to everybody um, and also a huge thank you to the Carnegie Corporation of New York who sponsored today's web seminar. It's a huge support to get these kind of sessions going. And finally, to our web seminar team. So the NSTA team of um, David Evans and Al Byers leading the troops and the entire web seminar team. We've got Don with us tonight. We've got um, uh, a number of people here. Um, let me try to think of We've got Ted, we've got Jeff, we've got our, a lot of our advisors, including the presenters. So it's just a really great team effort. Really, really happy to work with everyone. So with that, that ends our web seminar. Thank you again for participating, and we do hope that you will join us again at another NFT web seminar. Take care, everyone. Christina, are we going to end the recording and the, do the survey? Oh, sorry, guys. My computer.